The Halloween franchise has made so many twists and turns that trying to sort out the story can be a little confusing. No worries though, we've laid out the whole timeline in detail. From that first night of terror to Michael's bloody return, here's the entire Halloween story finally explained. Halloween opens on Halloween night in 1963. Judith Myers should be babysitting a six-year-old brother Michael, but what she's actually doing is making out with a boyfriend. So Michael decides he's going to spend his evening doing some killing. After slaughtering his sister, he's institutionalized and his psychiatrist, Dr. Sam Loomis, becomes convinced that Michael is pure evil and should never be allowed back into the world. I told everybody! Nobody listened. But in 1978, Michael escapes and heads back to his hometown, looking to pick up right where he left off. When he gets home, he finds high schooler Laurie Strode hanging around. So of course he decides to make her and her friends his next targets. For the rest of the night, Michael stalks and kills Laurie's friends, one by one. But Laurie is stronger than he gives her credit for, and she manages to fend him off long enough to allow Loomis to arrive on the scene and shoot him six times, knocking him off a balcony and onto the ground below. That same night, Laurie is taken to Haddonfield Memorial Hospital. Michael survives his fall from the balcony and follows Laurie because he's not one to let his victims get away. It's also discovered that Laurie is, surprise, Michael's younger sister. That girl, that Strode girl, that's Michael Myers' sister. And Michael is, even bigger surprise, possibly being kept alive because of a Samhain curse. Michael wanders through the hospital in search of Laurie, killing anyone and everyone that gets in his way, while Loomis starts his inevitable descent into madness, trying to convince anyone with an earshot of Michael's evil immortality. In a final confrontation, Michael stabs Loomis in the stomach, but not before Loomis sets the hospital up to explode. Laurie gets out in time, but Michael and Loomis are trapped inside when the building goes up in flames. Michael Myers takes a back seat in Halloween 3, which takes place a few days prior to the holiday. When a man is killed in a Northern California hospital by a group of mysterious well-dressed men, Dan Chalice, the doctor in charge of his care, takes it upon himself to try and solve the case. He traces the crime all the way back to Silver Shamrock Novelties and a man named Carnal Cochran, who somehow managed to steal a piece of Stonehenge. He plans to use it as part of a sacrifice involving children and a trio of Halloween masks with the goal of reclaiming the Samhain holiday for witches. But Dan thwarts Cochran's plan, for the most part. There are robots, killer bugs, and the possibility of a whole lot of child death, but no Michael Myers. A decade after the hospital explosion, Michael awakens from a coma, just in time to hunt his niece, Jamie, on Halloween. Jamie, as it happens, is a seven-year-old daughter of Laurie, who died in a car accident. Jamie's currently living with another family, but her true lineage isn't a secret, so she's bullied pretty heavily. Every day is Halloween at Jamie's house, right, Jamie? Because your uncle's the boogeyman. Halloween 4 is a pretty straightforward slasher flick, in that the bulk of it consists of Michael Myers killing a bunch of poorly developed characters in the most ridiculous ways imaginable. But eventually, Loomis returns because he somehow also managed to survive the hospital explosion and he helps Jamie defeat her uncle with the help of a town lynch mob. Sadly, it seems as though psychopathy runs in the family, because after Michael falls through a mineshaft, Jamie tries to kill her foster mother with a pair of scissors. Michael, wounded from the attempt on his life in Halloween 4, crawls into a cave and immediately passes out. He wakes up on Halloween Eve a year later, in the care of another cave dweller. Michael kills him and sets course for his niece, who's been living as a mute at the Haddonfield Children's Clinic for the last year. It's clear Jamie and Michael are connected on a deeper level than just blood. The two are psychically paired, so everything Michael does from here on out, Jamie sees. After his killing spree, Jamie tries to appeal to his emotions, but Michael isn't interested in anything other than killing. In my heart, I knew that hell would not <laughs> Loomis swoops in, but winds up suffering a stroke. There's no hero here, just a random set of circumstances that leads to Michael's arrest. In the end, a strange man in black who's been following Michael this entire time comes to the police station to retrieve him. Six years later, we learn that the man in black is the leader of a druid cult that's connected to Michael on account of a mark he has on the inside of his wrist. Turns out it's related to the so-called Curse of Thorn, the thing responsible for both Michael's immortality and his insatiable desire to kill his family. Michael's work isn't done in Haddonfield, and soon, very soon, he'll come home. Jamie, now 14, has delivered a baby in the captivity of the cult. Immediately after giving birth, she tries to escape the cult's clutches and outrun her uncle. She fails, and Michael kills her in a barn. The rest of the film shifts focus to Tommy Doyle, the now adult boy that Laurie Strode used to babysit. He's obsessed with the Curse of Thorn, and with the old Myers home in general. Eventually, thanks to his help, Loomis is able to take Michael down. Or is he? 
Laurie Strode makes her return to the franchise with Halloween H2O 20 years later, a film that gets back to basics, effectively wiping out everything that's happened after Halloween 2. Michael Myers is still family, but Laurie is alive, having faked her death, and she's working as the headmistress of a son John's private boarding school in California. Michael reappears 20 years after the hospital explosion and manages to track Laurie down by way of an old file one of Loomis's colleagues had on hand. In spite of her overprotective nature, Laurie can't protect John and his friends from Michael's wrath and on Halloween night, the masked killer stalks and kills pretty much everyone at the school before Laurie can subdue him. Laurie doesn't stop there, though. She hijacks the coroner's van with Michael's body, sends a slasher through the windshield, pins him to a fence, and then takes an axe to his head. All these years later, Laurie has finally gotten her revenge, except for one tiny detail. The man Laurie decapitated wasn't actually Michael. It was a paramedic with a crushed larynx that Michael had tricked her into thinking was him. Three years later, Laurie has convinced the staff at Grace Anderson Sanitarium that she's basically comatose while she waits for a final, final showdown with her brother. Things don't go as planned, and Laurie winds up with a knife in her back before she plummets off the hospital roof. I'll see you in hell. <laughs> The focus then turns to the old Myers house, where a group of college kids have agreed to star in an investigative web series. Michael follows the group into the house and proceeds to kill each hopeful internet star, all in front of a live audience who assumes for a good part of the night that everything happening is fake. When the Myers house is accidentally set ablaze, Michael is trapped inside and supposedly dies. You may have thought Laurie Strode was out for good, but 2018's Halloween made the decision to retcon everything after the 1978 original, which means that this time there's no sibling drama. Wasn't it her brother who, like, cold-blooded murdered all those teenagers? No. That's just a bit that some people made up to make him feel better, I think. And most importantly, Laurie is very much alive. Although she spent four decades living like the slasher movie equivalent of a doomsday prepper. Michael has been locked up at Smith's Grove Sanitarium, but after a pair of investigative reporters come to interview him, he decides 40 years is long enough behind bars and sets out for a final face-off with the babysitter that got away. Laurie, on the other hand, has a strained relationship with her daughter Karen, but her granddaughter Allison wants to mend fences. Everything changes when Michael returns, and Laurie Karen and Allison team up to take him down. It's discovered that Michael's psychiatrist, Dr. Sartain, is obsessed with him and was the one behind his escape. Eventually, the Strode clan defeats Michael with the power of fire and firearms. Gotcha. But as we all know, there's probably no stopping the psycho slasher. Check out one of our newest videos right here! Plus, even more Looper videos about your favorite horror movies are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.